How to Talk Dirty and Influence People. An autobiography by Lenny Bruce, as read by Aaron Chase. Filipinos come quick. Colored men are built abnormally large. Their wings look like a baby's arm with an apple and a fist. Ladies with short hair are lesbians. If you want to keep your man, rub all them on your pussy. Such bits of erotic folklore were related daily to my mother by Mrs. Jenksky, a middle-aged widow who lived across the alley. And despite the fact that she had volumes of books delivered by the postman every month, A Same Sex Life, Ovid of the God of Love, How to Make Your Marriage Partner More Compatible, they were all in plain brown wrapped marked personal. She would, be, she would begin in a pedantic fashion, using academic medical terminology, but within 10 minutes, she'd be spouting her hooray hornyisms. Their conversations drifted to me as I sat under the sink, picking at the ribbed linoleum, daydreaming, and staring at my Aunt May May's private business, guarded by its sink mate, the vigilant CN bottle vanguard of Lysol, Sonate, and Massengill. At this tender age, I knew nothing of douches. The only difference between men and women was that women always had headaches and didn't like whistling or cap guns, and men didn't like women. Well, that is, women they were married to. Aunt May May's private business, the portable bit it, was a large red rubber bulb with a long black nozzle. I could never figure out what the hell it was for. I thought maybe it was an anima bag for people who lived in buildings with a super who wouldn't allow anyone to put up nails to hang things on. I wondered if it was the horn that Harpo Marx squeezed to punctuate his silent sentences. All I knew was that definitely was not to be used for a water gun battle. And that was it. That was none of my business. When you're eight years old, nothing's any of your business. All my inquiries about Aunt May May's large red rubber bulb or why hair grew from the mole of her face and nowhere else or how come talcum powder stuck between her nays would get me the same answer. You know too much already, go outside and play. Her fear of me becoming a preteen was responsible for me getting more fresh air than any other kid in the neighborhood. In 1932, you really heard that word a lot, business. But it wasn't, hmm, I wonder what happened to the business. Everyone knew what happened to the business. There wasn't any. That dumb bastard, President Hoover, was blamed for driving us into the Depression by people who didn't necessarily have any interest in politics, but just like saying, that dumb bastard, President Hoover. I would sit all alone through endless hours and days, scratching out my homework on the red big boy tablet in our kitchen with the shiny flowered oil cloth, the icebox squatting over the pan that constantly overflowed, and the overhead light was bare save for a long brown string with a knot on the end where flies fell in love. I sort of felt sorry for the damn flies. They mean, they never hurt anybody. Even though they were supposed to carry diseases, I, I never heard anybody say, I caught anything from a fly. My cousin gave two guys the clap and nobody whacked her with a newspaper. The desperate tension of the Depression was lessened for me by the Thilico radio with the yellow-orange dial and the black numbers in the center. What a dear, sweet friend, my wooden radio, with the sensual cloth webbing that separated its cathedral-like architecture from the mass airwave propaganda I was absorbing. It was the beginning of an awareness of a whole new fantasy culture, Jump on the Manhattan merry-go-round, the highway, the byway to New York town. And here comes Captain Andy now, the biggest swinger 
was Mr. First Nighter. He always had a car waiting for him. Take me to the little theater off Times Square. Barbara Ludi and Les Trayman. And Joe Penner said, yuck, 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 yuck. With a cloud of dust and the speed of light and a hearty, hi, yo, silver. Proctor and Gamble provided many full, bright, and Jewin Fellowships winners with the same formative exposure. Long Island had loads of screen doors and porches. Screen doors to push your nose against, porches to hide under. It always smelled funny under the porch. I had a continuing vision of one day crawling under there and finding a large cache of money, which I would spend nobly on my mother and aunt, but not until they explained the under-the-sink apparatus and if there was enough money, perhaps May May would even demonstrate it for me. I would usually hide under the porch until it came time to get in. Just wait till your father comes home, then you're really going to get it. I always thought, what a pain in the ass it would be to be a father. Just have to work all day, and then instead of resting when you come home, you have to give it to somebody. And I didn't get it as much as other kids, though, because my father and mother were divorced. I had to wait until visiting days to get it. I look back in tender, relished anger, and I can smell the damp newspapers that waited on the porch for the goodwill. They never picked up anything we gave them because we never had packed it right. And I can hear the muffled voices through the Curestone stove. Hey, Mickey, I don't know what we're doing here going to Lenny's. He was just so fresh with Mama. You know what he asked? Then they would all laugh hysterically. And then my father would schlep me from under the, the porch and whack the crap out of me, you know, for being fresh with Mama. For forgetting to change my good clothes after school and catching my corduroy knickers on the nail. And for whistling. I would even get it for whistling. I used to love whistling. The first tune I learned to whistle was... Ampola. Amapola, my pretty little poppy. I received most of my musical education from the sounds that wafted from the alley of Angelo's Bar and Grill. Ladies invited, free lunch. I was enthralled with the discovery of the jukebox. A machine that didn't sew, drill, boil, or kill. A machine solely for fun. Angelo the Tavern Keeper was a classic illustration of automatopoeia. He laughed, her, 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 her. He talked exactly like the balloons in a comic strip. When he was disturbed, he would say, to express contempt, he would say, harumph. I kept waiting for his dog Angelo to say, arf, arf. And he never made a sound. I told this to Russell Swan, the, the oil painter, sometime house painter and town drunk. He replied that the dog had been interbred with a giraffe, a reference I didn't understand, but which cracked up the irredude Mr. Swan. It must have been lonesome, being bright and witty and aware, but living in a town where you can't relate to people in all areas. Mr. Swan gave me the first book I ever read, Richard Holliburton's Royal Road to Romance the tale of a world traveler who continually searches for beauty and inner peace. Oh, I love to read. Don't read at the table, I would be told. Why do they put stuff on the cereal box if they don't want you to read it? Not at the table. When I get big, I thought, I'll read anywhere I want, standing in the subway. Hey, what's that you're reading, sir? A cereal box. I always made a good score in the back of Angelo's bar and grill. And the loot consisted of deposit bobble, bottles. But there was a hang-up. You could never find anyone willing to cash them. The most sought-after prize was a large Huffman bottle, which brought a five-cent bounty. Mr. Gerardo, our neighbor grocer, cashed my mother's relief check and 
so he knew we would barely have enough money for staples. Therefore, the luxury of soda pop and deposit bottles was obviously far beyond our economic sphere. Besides, he couldn't relate to children. He disliked them because they made him nervous. Could I have a glass of water, please? No, the water's broken. When I bought the bottles to him, he would interrogate me without an ounce of mercy. Did you buy these here? When did you buy them? I would always fall prey to his Olga of Interpol tactics. Yes, I think we bought them here. Then he would finger thump me on the back of the head as if he was testing a watermelon. Oh, get the hell out of here. You never bought any soda here. I'm going to report your mother to welfare, man, and have him take your check away. I could hear the welfare man saying to me, Ma, your nephew, you know, the one who knows too much already, he's been arrested on a deposit bottle charge. We have to take your check away. Then where would Mima go? We would all have to live under the porch with that funny smell. That was the big threat of the day, taking the check away. Generality spewed forth the geome where always being threatened with loss of their checks because of their presence in the bar and the, the yidden for their presence at the bank. Another sure way for a family to lose its check was for any member to be caught going to the movies. But I didn't worry about that. My friend and I would sneak in, hide under the seats while the porter was vacuuming, and then after the newsreel was over, we would pop up in the midst of Lou Lair's Monijes de Crazies Bipel. Anyway, my next stop with the deposit bottles would be to King Cullen Market. And the manager stared at me. I returned his stare with no apparent guile. I tried to look as innocent and Anglo-Saxon as Jackie Cooper, pouting, pooched out lips and all, but I'm sure I looked more like a dwarfed Maurice Chevalier. I bought them yesterday. I don't know how the dirt and cobwebs got inside. He cashed the bottles and I got my 20 cents. I bought a Liberty magazine for my mother, and she liked to read them because the reading time was, quote, four minutes, three seconds. She used to clock herself, and her chief aim was to beat the quoted time. She always succeeded, but probably never knew what the hell she had read. I bought Aunt Mima a 12-cent jar of Vaseline. She ate it by the ton. She was a Vaseline addict. She would rub it on and stick it in anything and everything. To me, Ma, carbolated Vaseline was Jewish penicillin. Perhaps at this point I ought to say a little something about my vocabulary. My conversation, spoken and written, is usually flavored with the jargon of the hipster, the argot of the underworld and Yiddish. In the literal sense, a literal as Yiddish can be since it's not Formal language, goish means Gentile, but that's not the way I mean to use it. To me, if you live in New York or any other big city, you are Jewish. It doesn't matter, even if you're Catholic, if you live in New York, you're Jewish. If you live in Bamut, Montana, you're going to be goish even if you are Jewish. Evaporated milk is goish even if Jews invented it, chocolate is Jewish, and fudge is goish. Spam is goish, rye bread is Jewish, Negroes are all Jewish, Italians are all Jewish, Irishmen who have rejected their religion are Jewish, mouths are very Jewish, and bosoms. Baton twirling is very goish. Georgie Jessel and Danny Thomas are Christians because if you look closely at their bodies, you'll find a boil somewhere. To trap an old Jewish woman, they're crafty and they will lie. Just seize one and you'll find a handkerchief balled up in one of their hands. I can understand why we can't have a Jewish president. I mean, it would be embarrassing to hear the president's mother screaming love at the, at the grandchildren. Who's grandbaby? Who's grandbaby? And this is Chet Huntley in New York's first lady's mother opened by the Macy's Day Parade screaming, Oi, jeez, Miss Lipster, and furiously pinching young Stanley's cheek. Actually, she bit his ass, going, mm, yum, yum, yum. Is this tushy? Whose tushy is that? The Jewish are notorious children's ass kissers. Gentiles neither bite their children's asses 
nor do they ha-ha their soup. Gentiles love their children as much as Jews love theirs, but they just don't wear their hearts on their sleeves. On the other hand, Jewish mothers don't hang gold stars on their windows. They're not proud of their boys going into the service. They're always worried about their being killed. Celebrate is a Goish word. Observe is a Jewish word. Mr. and Mrs. Walsh are celebrating Christmas with Major Thomas Moreland, USAF, while Mr. and Mrs. Brumberg observe Hanukkah with Goldie and Arthur Schindler from the Kemesha, New York. The difference between Jewish and Goish girls is that a Gentile girl won't touch it once, whereas a Jewish girl will kiss you and then let you touch it. Your own, that is. The only thing Jewish, the only Jewish thing about bawling is Vaseline. One eventful day, I discovered self-gratification. An older kid conducted a school, and five of us graduated about the same time. A few days later, I was set for an afternoon of whacking. I had a copy of National Geographic with, pic- with pictures of naked chicks in Africa. I'm sure that when these spade ladies with taco tits pose for Osa and Martin Johnson, they never dreamed that they would be part of an 11-year-old's sexual fantasies, or they certainly wouldn't have signed a model's release. I was propped up on my bed, taking care of business, I was so involved, I didn't hear the door open. Leonard, what are you doing? It was my father. My heart dropped. I froze. He repeated. I said, what are you doing? To say it was a traumatic moment would be euphemistic. I had to restrain myself from asking, would you wait outside for just a minute? He snarled. It's not only disgusting what you're doing, but God damn it in my bed. He sat down and proceeded to tell me a story. That story we've all heard with embellishments. Its grim conclusion left three of our relatives in a state of an insane asylum. Poor souls who had never been instructed of the wisdom of sleeping with their hands above the covers. The storyline implied that this sort of thing was a nightmare practice and was associated with werewolves and vampires. Their punishment was that their hands withered away into wings and they couldn't pull it anymore, just fan it a little bit. I had all sorts of horrendous visions of my future. My spine would collapse, my toes would fall off. Even though I resolved to never do it again, I felt that I had done some sort of irreputable damage. Oh, what a cursed thing. I could see myself on street corners giving testimonies for the CBWA. Crooked backwhackers anonymous. Yes, brothers, I was of immortal flesh. Fortunately for me, my father walked in that day while I was having my struggle with Satan. Suppose he had not an observant person and merely thought I was doing a charade, committing Harry Carey triple time. What then? But no, brothers, he knew he had a pervert living under his roof. The most dangerous of all, a whacker. I would have, I would have stopped. I would have had to stop. No tapering off. I would have to stop now. In the language of the addict's world, I would have to kick the habit. Cold jerky.